good morning. Welcome to this uh, service today on this beautiful day in May. Isn't it nice out? We'd like to welcome you who are online, you here in the parking lot, and everyone here in the auditorium. We're glad you're here, and I just want to make a few announcements. Uh, this is Dinner Theater Week, uh, so uh, the Dinner Theater will be this Friday and uh, this Saturday. It's still not too late to sign up, so if you haven't signed up, let me encourage you to do so. Uh, and if you're online this morning, feel free to call the church, and you can sign up on, on the phone line. You just call the church, and they sign you up. Uh, we also still need volunteers uh, to help serve at the dinner theater. Uh, you can come one night and serve the other night. Uh, you get two free meals. How's that? That's a good deal, isn't it? So, so I, I encourage you, if you'd like to volunteer, uh, uh, young people and up, just uh, uh, stop by the uh, uh, table back there and sign up. Also, because of Dinner Theater, there's no Wednesday evening service this week. Uh, we will be having uh, 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 practice that night. So uh, be praying for Dinner Theater. Invite your friends. Invite your enemies. And we're going to have a good time. Amen? And uh, say, why did you invite me? Because you're my enemy. He said, invite your enemy. I wouldn't tell him that. but uh, just to... Anyway, this time, Brother Adam's going to come and lead us in prayer as we begin our service this morning. Lamentations 3, 22 through 24. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are anew every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Mercy. Things that God should give us but doesn't. It's fantastic, right? And rather than replacing with judgment... He replaces it with restoration. And as we stand this morning, let's sing to that. Because every day, he gives us a second chance, and a second chance, and a second chance. Every morning, for us to come back to him and be reconciled. So let's stand to that since this morning. <laughs> Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How can my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free. For oh, wonderful grace of Jesus. Thank you. 
the mountains, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Broader than the scope of my confession, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise His name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reach to those defiled. By its transforming power, make it in God's dear child. Purchase the peace and heaven for all eternity.
Father, great is your faithfulness. Our sinful nature continues to always want to turn away from you, and each day you give us new breath, new life to come back and repent, and you're there to give us reconciliation once again. Father, we thank you for the fact that your son, Jesus Christ, gave us that saving grace that we needed to come back to you, and Father, without that, we know that we deserve nothing but death. Father, just be with this service, be with Pastor Roger as he delivers the message, and Lord, we just hope that the gospel message is just proclaimed through everything that is done here this morning. For us in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, worship team. If you will take your Bibles, and as we continue the book of Judges, we are going to cover the 10th, 11th, and 12th chapter today. Uh, it's about Jephthah, it's uh, concerning him, and so we're going to cover it all in one section. We won't read all three chapters, uh, but you can follow along in your Bible and hit key points of it. Uh, we're going to talk about seeing God in the battle for the redemption of his chosen people. And uh, so if you will take your Bibles and stand, and you can watch on the screen and behind me. Uh, we begin with verse 6 of chapter 10, and just follow along. And it says this, a familiar saying in the book of Judges. The people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and served the Baals and the Ashtoreths, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. And they forsook the Lord and did serve him. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of the Philistine and into the hand of the Ammonites. And they crushed and oppressed the people of Israel that year. For 18 years they oppressed all the people of Israel who were beyond the Jordan in the land of the Amorites, which is Gilead. Verse 16. So they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord, and he became impatient over the misery of Israel. Look at chapter 11, verse 1. Now Jephthah the Gileadite, or Gileadite was a mighty warrior. He was, of the son of a, he was the son of a prostitute. Gilead was the father of Jephthah, and Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. And worthless fellows collected around Jephthah and went out with him. After a time, the Ammonites made war against Israel. And when the Ammonites made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to bring Jephthah from the land of Tob. And they said to Jephthah, Come and be our leader, that we may fight against the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. He said, If you will give the Ammonites into my hand, in verse 30, Verse 31, then whatever comes out from the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace and the Ammonites shall be the Lord's and I will offer it for a burnt offering. Verse 34, then Jephthah came to his home at Mizpah and behold his daughter came out to meet him with tamarind and with dances. She was his only child besides her. He had neither son nor daughter. Verse 39, and at the end of two months she returned to her father who did with her according to his vow he had made. She had never known a man, and it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went year by year to lament the daughter of Jephthah the Gilead at four days in the year. Then Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim and the men, in verse 12, verse 4, then Jephthah gathered all men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim, and the men of Gilead struck Ephraim because they said, You are a fugitive of, Je of Ephraim, you Gileadites in the midst of Ephraim and Manasseh. Verse 5. And Gileads captured the fords of the Jordan against the Ephraimites. And when any of the fugitives of Ephraim said, Let me go over, the men of Gilead said to him, Are you an Ephraimite? When he said no, they said to him, Then say, Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth. For he could not pronounce, the, pronounce it right. Then they seized him and slaughtered him at the fords of the Jordan. At that time, 42,000 of the Ephraimites fell. Jephthah judged six years or six years. Then Jephthah the Gileadite died and was buried in his city in Gilead. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you bless the reading of your word and give us insight as we look at this this morning. Lord, speak to our hearts. Instruct us. May we respond. 
and honor you. Uh, Lord, uh, give us clarity of thought and wisdom this morning as we examine your holy word in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I was reading this passage this week. You just can't make this stuff up. I was going to title the sermon as the world turns. But uh, that's already been taken, I think. But today we're looking at three different chapters in the book of Judges, three difficult chapters. Chapter 10 begins by mentioning two minor judges who lived and died. And chapter 12 ends with three minor judges who lived and died. Sandwiched between the minor judges is the outlandish life of Jephthah. In these chapters, we see, though, the hand of God accomplishing his redemptive plan among men. God's at work here. And in our text today, we will see the character of God in the battle for the redemption of his chosen people. The first thing I want us to notice is, uh, the first thing is that God is gracious to provide leaders who establish law and order. You say, what does that have to do with anything? Simply uh, put, if a society loses all law and order, they destroy themselves, or God in His justness will destroy them. And God is all about preserving the nation of Israel for the purpose of bringing about His redemption plan. And so God is gracious to provide leaders to make sure there's a certain amount of law and order to preserve the people. I know that flies in the face of what's going around in our country today about, uh, you know, uh, abolish the police and people do their own thing. Let me remind you, in Judges, every man was doing what was right in his own eyes, and God raised up judges to help corral the people. We find in Romans 13, 1, it tells that everyone must submit to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, uh, and those exist are instituted by God. And verse 4, it says in Romans 12, or 13, uh, for government is God's servant for your good, but if you do wrong, be afraid, because it does not carry the sword for no reason. I second, does not carry the sword for no reason. Now, you know, the only time a government will use a sword on you is if you are fighting it, or if they're executing you, okay? And so we look from Romans chapter 13 that it appears that uh, the Bible says the government is there uh, to use the sword on people who do not, uh, uh, or who, who become lawless, okay? And this is ordained of God because we're all depraved people. We all have the habit of wanting to do our own thing. And in America, I know in the United States, we are we the people, we say, and, and we're free, I know. But there's a, a free country can only exist as long as we got the character to be self-governing. In Judges, they lost that. And when you lose the character to be self-governing, you become a, a riotous mob that demands your own way and do your own thing. And therefore, that's how dictators rise to power to control the people. That's how kings come to power and so forth. And so remember, uh, you say, well, I live in a democratic republic. That's true, but that's, that's really a, something that uh, it's hard to keep. Because it takes character to be self-governing. When everyone demands their own way, then you cannot be self-governing anymore. You become a country full of warlords. So we find God ordains leaders to establish law and order. Believe it or not, God ordained Hitler. God ordained Stalin. God ordained George Washington. God ordained Chairman Mao. You say, does that mean God approves of all of them? Not at all. Their job was law and order, and many of those abused their authority and power and suffered because of that, if you follow what I'm saying. In this chapter, we see two minor judges being raised. In verse 1, it says, after Amalek, there arose to save Israel. Notice that. After Amalek, after a fellow who came to power with a coup d'etat and caused great damage in the name of, in the land of Israel, Uh, his selfish, his cancel culture, his playing the racist card. Uh, Amalek, he rose and, and he was destroyed along with all the people that supported him. God sent another judge to save Israel. 
See, sometimes God raises leaders to preserve a nation for such a time as this. I mean, remember the story of Esther. Okay? And we find that Tola was the first one here. In verse 1, it says, he was the son of Pua, the son of uh, Dodo. That's an interesting name of Iskar. And lived at Shamar in the hill country of Ephraim. And he judged Israel 23 years. Then he died. So uh, the judge is saying, God raised up this guy. And what does it say about him? Not a whole lot. He had a good pedigree. Okay. Uh, tells his family story. Evidently, he just did what he was supposed to do and he died. Uh, kind of just his name is mentioned. But you need good leaders. Then after that, Jared came. And he was a man who arose of Gilead, Gileadite, which was the same as Jephthah uh, city. And he judged Israel 22 years in verse 3 and 4. He had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys. He said, what does that mean? When you rode a donkey, that means you were wealthy. Kings rode on donkeys. Wealthy people could afford donkeys. Uh, it might as well say Mercedes if we was in today's culture. He had 30 sons who drove Mercedes. How many of you know what I'm getting at now, right? And each of those 30 sons ruled over cities. And, you know, sometimes God uh, puts in leaders who have a good pedigree. Sometimes he put in leaders who are wealthy. Okay. Uh, what's wrong with a wealthy leader? Well, that's good. But, you know, he had 30 sons who, who rode donkeys or drove Mercedes, I guess you say. They ruled over 30 cities. Uh, but the idea here is stability and comfort and security for the people. God is gracious to provide leaders who establish order because it's part of of the hand of God in the battle for redemption. The fact that uh, when God is doing a work, uh, uh, example, Chairman Mao in, uh, in China. I won't stay too long on this point. I hope not to. But, uh, but uh, he uh, put everybody in a small group in China so they could read their little red book on communism. Now, God ordained that. Why? Because God had other things in mind. He used Chairman Mao and his self-centeredness to... Uh, indoctrinate people with communists. Do you know what happened with that plan? When Christianity started to spread, guess what? Everybody was already in a small group, Amen. used to studying little books, and it couldn't stop it. And China flourished. Thank you, Chairman Mao. In Cuba, the Castro government said, you, you can't have more than, I forgot, 10 or I don't know the exact figure of, of people meeting together because they was having trouble with people meeting in house churches in Cuba and they wanted to do away with it. So no more than, I think it was 10 people could meet in one home at one time. Thank you, communist, because all that did was instead of those groups, they just all went like uh, hornets everywhere and started other small groups and Christianity exploded in Cuba as well. The Roman roads built great roads so they could conquer their empire. Thank you, Caesar, because those Roman roads led to the rapid spread of Christianity all over the world. You with me now? God is gracious to provide leaders who establish order. They might do it for their own purpose. They might have their own agenda, but God is using it for his redemptive plan. Something else. God is jealous in disciplining his people for their idolatry. This is all part of the hand of God. The evil of God's people. We read in our text this morning. The people of, of Israel uh, did what was evil in God's eyes. And this time they were worshiping Baal, Ashtoreth. The gods of Syria, uh, Sidon, Moab, and Ammonites. The god of the Philistines. In other words, Israel had took a further step. And now they were worshiping all the gods of Canaan area. Of Palestine. Boy, they were really deep in idolatry. And the Bible says they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. And what's God's reaction? Verse 7. He was angry. He was kindled. His anger was kindled. And he turned them over to the hand of the Philistines and the Ammonites to discipline them. To teach them if you don't want to do it my way, you see what it's like doing it their way. And the Philistines and the Ammonites made slaves of them, killed them, took their stuff. You know, it's much better to have God as your God than someone who works, worships a pagan God. And God says, I will give you a taste of what you really want to see if you really want that. You know, God sometimes allows us to experience the, what we've sown. We reap what we've sown. And, and God, uh, in his gracious, sometimes doesn't give us fully uh, what we deserve. So don't ever say, boy, this bad times, I don't deserve this. You don't deserve that. 
Don't ever say, because if you really knew what you would deserve, you wouldn't be saying that, right? But we find uh, uh, the Lord sent a crushing oppression on the people. Uh, it says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, the Lord says, I am, I the Lord your God am a jealous God. God is jealous of any God in our life, small g, anything that takes his place in our life. He's jealous. Uh, the spirit that dwells in us lusts us to envy. In other words, God wants us for his own. Just like a jealous husband, God is jealous in perfect holiness, in a perfect way. He is jealous over his people, and he, do, he does not want them worshiping other gods. He, he doesn't want people not loving him with all their heart, their, mo their mind, their soul, and their strength. Anything short of that is idolatrous you said boy preacher I can't live up to that that's right that's why Jesus had to die right to, to fill the gap because we can't live up in it but we find that God is jealous and disciplining his people and so, so God is disciplining, uh, disciplining the nation of Israel his chosen physical people on earth he also disciplines his spiritual people the church the Christians, the believer, he disciplines us. It says in Hebrews chapter 12, 8, if you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate and children and not sons. In other words, if God never spanks you and you can live and do what you want and God never corrects you, the Bible says you're not really his child. The Christian who sins gets spanked. And the Christian who sins enough gets called home early. As an ambassador, you get called home because you sinned. You say, why does God do that? He's jealous. He's a jealous God. He disciplines us for his glory. But remember, it's all about the battle for redemption. He wants to save you from the penalty of sin, but also he wants to save you from the power of sin. That's why he spanks you. And he wants to save you from the presence of the uh, sin. That's why you don't go to heaven in your natural body. He gives you a new body so you won't sin in heaven. God disciplines people. He is jealous. So, so we see in our text, we see God is gracious. He provides leaders. He provides uh, the discipline of his people to bring them back to him. And he wants to bring Israel back to him because if they keep going the way they're going, he, by his justice, will need to destroy them. And it's all about his redemptive plan. He wants to preserve the Jewish people through which Christ would come or will come. It's all about that for his glory. Something else I want us to notice. God is patient in bringing people to repentance. Not only does he discipline, but he's impatient because look at verse 9. It says here, and the Ammonites crossed the Jordan to fight also against Judah and against Benjamin. At first, they were on the east side of the Jordan, the other tribes there. But now he, the Ammonites are now going deeper into what we know as Israel to fight Judah. And the Bible says Israel was severely distressed in verse 9. Uh, distress means a uh, connotation of being backed into a corner. God backed them into a corner. In other words, God's discipline increased the pressure on Israel. You know, if this doesn't work, something else is going to work. Like Jonah. If Jonah would have been able to kick and scream enough to get out of the belly of the whale, what would have happened? A bigger fish would have swallowed him. Because it was all about God's bringing people to repentance and discipline and character. Kind of like I told you before, the kid who doesn't want to take uh, the king along with his dad. Uh, uh, so he, I'm going to leave home. What are you going to do? I'm going to join the Marines. Because I'm tired of taking orders. Or the young lady who says, who, who, who says, uh, uh, you know, I don't, I don't uh, like my dad. He's, he's too controlling, you know. So she gets married. A few years later, she says to her husband, you're just like my dad. See, if we try to rush the washing machine, you know, a washing machine has cycles. Everything has a purpose in it. 
God has cycles in our life. He wants, he, he, you're going through a washing machine. He wants you to make sure that you get good and soaked, and then you get, you get spin dried, okay? If you try to rush it, you get thrown back in the washing machine for, to complete the cycle. We go through life trying to shortcut the cycles. And God is patient to bring people to repentance. Israel uh, was not repenting. And so now God puts the pressure and now he allows Judah. Now, Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Judah is very important to God. But he allows them to be in distress. Finally, in verse 10, the people of Israel cried out to God, We have sinned against you. We have forsaken our God and have served the Baals. And you know what God tells them then? He says, Didn't I not save you? Verse 11, Now the Egyptians and the Ammonites, and he says, Yet you've forsaken me and served other gods. He says, Go cry to your gods whom you've chosen. Let them save you in your time of distress. We call that tough love, don't we? God's not Santa Claus. Lord, forgive me. God says, well, didn't you ignore me all these years? Go back to all those gods you served. And, and what God is at, he's patiently bringing them, to, bringing them to genuine repentance. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. But the farther you get from committing the sin, the more sorry you should be. That's genuine repentance. Finally, in verse 15, And the people of Israel said to the Lord, We have sinned. Do to us whatever seems good to you. No more bargaining, God. Do whatever you do. We've sinned. Just deliver us. And they put away their foreign gods in verse 16. Wow. So God is patiently disciplining him. He's tightening the screws. He's bringing people to repentance. He does that for believers and unbelievers. It's kind of like the unbeliever goes through life and they think they're pretty good and, and then God starts dealing with them about their sin and I'm not that bad. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not a, a full sinner. I, I do some good. And God brings them to the point he knocks every crutch out from underneath them. He brings them to their knees. Then they see themselves as guilty of sin and worthy of hell. And they say, Lord, do to me whatever you want, but Lord, have mercy on me. Put, I put away my foreign gods. That's exactly what God brings you. You know, Jacob, uh, Jacob was a guy who fought against God, and he wrestled with the Lord or the angel of the Lord, and the Lord uh, brought him to touch the hollow of his thigh, and he, and, he, and he lost his strength in his hip, and he couldn't fight anymore. God brings you to where there's no more fight left. Then the Lord's going to leave, and Jacob says, I won't let you go till you bless me. Uh, Jacob was fighting off God. By the end of the battle, he was hanging on to God. Please don't leave me like this. That's the way God works in salvation. The Holy Spirit brings you to the place of being lost in need of a Savior. He's patient in doing this. A slow millstone kind of a grind, I guess you could say. Brings you to the point of lostness where you trust Christ and you understand. And we confess our sins. Why is God doing that? Because that's the hand of God in the battle for redemption. Leaders for law and order. Disciplined people for idolatry and bringing you to repentance. That's what God wants to do. And then God is also merciful in intervening to deliver his people. In verse 16, they put away their gods and among them and served the Lord. And it says that he became impatient over the misery of Israel. You say, what does that mean? It means, the New English translation says, it means finally the Lord grew tired of seeing Israel suffer so much. New Living Translation says, and he was grieved by their misery. In other words, when they repented, God finally was grieved that, you know, they're suffered enough. I'm going to deliver them by just my grace and by my mercy. He's merciful in intervening to deliver his people. You say, why does he deliver them? Because he's got a bigger plan in mind. It's not all about his people. It's about his glory. It's about his redemption plan. And so God is working in the book of Judges. Is that the Lord's mercies were not consumed because of his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. He wants to deliver his people. He's merciful. And we want to get in the heart of the message next. We see also another thing as we look at the hand of God. We see God is sovereign in choosing imperfect vessels to deliver his people. You know, we talked about imperfect vessels of Mayo and Hitler and and uh, Castro, and all these men were sinful men. God still used them, but even the saved people God has used, they were all imperfect. 
but God still used them. That's why we need to be careful about our country when we start criticizing the founding fathers of our country. We need to not put ourselves above them. Realize they were imperfect men living in imperfect times. It was a whole different time of understanding. And you who are older understand exactly what I'm talking about. How many of you say preacher times have changed? (laughs) Huh? I mean, you look back and you say, boy, back in those days, we did this, but, you know, we, we were kind of off. We just didn't really understand it that way. Ron and I watched the movie the other night, uh, uh, Roe v. Wade. If you, if you haven't seen you all see that's an excellent movie. It talked about the doctor that was all for aborting, you know, ab- uh, abortions, make fortunes. You know, he, that was his theme, you know, make money by abortions. And until finally they came out with... Uh, Uh, the ultrasounds, I guess, uh, where they could actually see the baby. And the doctor in the movie who performed, I forgot how many thousands of abortions, made money. He was was the ramrod behind all this. He started weeping because he realized that baby's moving. That's a baby. Before, he could not, they, you know, he did it in ignorance, I guess you could say. You could not see. You didn't know. But once they could see of course, they could see when the baby was aborted that it had feet and hands and stuff like that. But then he became the doctor over the, uh, that, uh, that interviewed on the silent scream. Remember the uh, movie Silent Scream? It, it shows where a baby is experiencing pain during abortion. Okay, and he was the one that interpreted it. He was the father of, of, of the Roe v. Wade to get it legalized. And, and uh, he turned totally around uh, so was the young lady Roe v. Wade was about. You know, several of those people became believers, Christians. Because a lot of things they did in ignorance. Don't forget Paul went around killing Christians in ignorance before he met Jesus. So my, my point is, God chooses imperfect vessels. And sometimes we do things in ignorance we don't really understand. But God still uses, you know, your, your parents were not perfect. They did stuff and... You realize the error of some of the things they did, you still love them, they're your parents. They were still ordained of God to be your parents, right? You don't throw them out for this or that. So even in our forefathers of our country, they've done some things, but we don't understand the times. We were not there. Okay. Times change, people change. If we're looking the right direction. But God is sovereign in choosing imperfect vessels. And, and so we find in, in uh, verse 17... Uh, the leaders of Gilead were looking for a man to lead them because the Ammonites had invaded them. And who were going to have? And then it goes right into the story of Jephthah. And we find Jephthah uh, was a mighty warrior but was from a dysfunctional family. His mother was a prostitute. And his brothers did not want him to share in the inheritance of, the, of their mother who was uh, the wife of, uh, of Jephthah's dad. And so they ran him off to the land of Tob. And over there, he was a magnet for worthless people, or, I don't know, gangsters, I guess you could say, right? He was a magnet, so uh, very dysfunctional. And when the Ammonites made war, the elders of uh, Gilead went to recruit Jephthah in verse 4 and 6. Uh, and said, come be our leader, and it's chapter 11, uh, that we might fight against the Ammonites. So they threw him out because he was a son of a prostitute, but when it came time for war, they knew he was the guy to, to get. Man, he, he knew all these ruthless guys. You know, he knew all the thugs, and we need thugs against these Ammonites. And so they want to recruit him. And so uh, when they came to recruit him in verse 7, uh, he reminds them, Jephthah reminds them of their previous hate toward him, and they made a deal that if he comes to lead the army, he would be head in Gilead. That's the same family that threw him out. But you'd be head. And so Jephthah, he comes and he leads the army. The son of a prostitute from a dysfunctional family who was a magnet for the undesirables of the world, I guess you could say. This is who God's going to use. You see... God didn't always use people who went to Sunday school, right? He, he didn't always use people who were raised proper. God chooses the foolish, base things of the world sometimes to do his work. As I said before, when I used to tear up the Sunday school class when I was a kid, 
the old man told his wife he was going to quit. She was going to quit because I was such a brat. He said, Marge, hang in there. Be patient. God always calls those kind. I found that out years later. You know, yeah, God always calls those kinds. And, and so we find that Jephthah, he sends messengers uh, to the king of the Ammonites to negotiate in verse 12. He says, what do you have uh, against me that you have come to fight against my land? And, and uh, the Ammonites uh, said, you took our land away uh, from Arnon to Jebok to Jordan, and now therefore restored peaceably. And there's, there's a fight over land. Let me put it this way. You know, the southwest part of the United States used to be what part of what country? It used to be part of Mexico. Okay. And also, uh, west of the Mississippi used to be owned by France. Remember the Louisiana Purchase? You guys remember that in school? Maybe they don't teach that anymore. Okay. My point is, is that everybody's land used to be somebody's land. We have people say, well, you know, you drove the Native Americans off their land, but they don't mention that the Native Americans drove someone else off the land before they got there. There's always been fighting over land. Give it back. I mean, matter of fact, that's what caused part of World War II. Hitler uh, wanted uh, some land that, that had Germanic people in it. So all the, you know, the, it was fighting over land and this land and that land. Uh, kings have always fought over property. But Jephthah replies that Israel didn't take their land. Uh, they, when, when they left Egypt, hundreds of years earlier, they tried to go around it. And they asked to pass through some of the land. And they didn't enter the territory of Moab. Uh, uh, they, did, they didn't, but there was a king, uh, King Sion, who refused to let them go through and attack them. Okay. And you don't attack Israel because God's the God of Israel, right? And so it defeated them. So Israel took possession of all the land of the Amorites who inhabited that country in verse 20, uh, verse 21. So notice it says, Israel took possession of all the land that the Ammonites who inhabited that country. So the Ammonites inhabited country that was not all their native country, but inhabited another country. So Israel took possession. Kind of like the Golan Heights in Israel. How many of you remember that, right? They're still fighting over uh, who's, who that is. And so the Lord dispossessed the Ammonites from before Israel. Uh, and Jephthah reveals... Though, to the king, his lack of theological understanding by giving credence uh, to false gods in verse 24. He says to the, to the king and Ammonites, Will you not possess what Chemosh your God gives you to possess? And all that the Lord God has disposed before us, we will possess. And what he's saying is, he says, you know, will you not take what your God gives you? By doing that, Jephthah is acknowledging that their God is a legitimate God. You with me? He's reasoning. And what we're trying to get at the mind of Jephthah. Jephthah uh, was from a dysfunctional family. He was raised in a syncretized society where they worshipped Yahweh and Baal. Maybe more Baal than Yahweh. He had a mixture of, of, uh, of uh, Judistic beliefs. But he also had a mixture of pagan beliefs. And so he was reasoning. And he... He calls their god Chemish when actually their god was Moloch. Moloch was the god that God hated because they would offer their kids sacrifice to Moloch in the fire. His theological error is, shows his lack of understanding of theology. And let me just camp out there for a moment. Theology is important. Here's Jephthah making wrong decisions, doing wrong things based upon a faulty theology or even superstition. A lot of people that way today. And it's because they fail to, to know and understand God's word. And we see this leads to devastating results uh, a little bit later on. In other words... He should know that the God, God had given the Ammonites and the Amorites their land, okay? And God had given Israel certain land. But instead of saying that, you know, you know, the living God has given us this land, he says, 
your God gives you your land, my God gives me my land, and that's totally not true. In verse 29, we find the Spirit of the Lord comes upon Jephthah, and, and now they're ready to fight this battle. Now, when it says the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, it doesn't mean that it came upon him internally to transform his character, but it came, he came upon him externally to give him the power. Because in the Old Testament, when the Holy Spirit came upon people, they still could make wrong decisions, but, the, but God was guiding them in the direction he wanted them to go for the, for the outcome of, of battles and such, if you know what I'm talking about. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit dwells in you, and you've produced the fruit of the Spirit. Jephthah is not producing the fruit of the Spirit. Matter of fact, so he's going to war, and he makes a rash vow. And he says, Lord, if you will give the Ammonites into my hands, uh, whatever comes out my door when I get home will be a burnt offering offered to you. Now, first of all, what's he thinking? You know, uh, many believe that Jephthah was actually trying to manipulate God to get his way. He said, Lord, I, I'm going to give you whatever comes out my door. And he's doing the vow to make sure that God uh, does what he wants him to. But if he knew God, he'd understand you can't manipulate God. That was the theology of the Canaanite religions. You manipulated your God. You, you actually did stuff and your God returned you a favor. Okay? So that shows his theology is his error. And whatever comes out of my house. Now, it's, per, it's perfectly possible in the Old Testament, you know, animals lived in the house. Matter of fact, in the houses uh, of the Old Testament, the upper section, people lived and had a lower section because they kept their animals in at night because people would steal them and, and rob from them. And so the most valuable thing you had was your animals, so you kept it in part of your house. It was kind of like your garage. You got a two-door attached garage. Uh, in every house of those houses, would, would people live in one section and have kind of like an attached part of the same place? It was part of the house, the door, and, and the animals were in there overnight. Okay? Uh, well, anyway, it appears that he's trying to negotiate with God. And the problem here is whatever comes out of my house. Uh, he was trying to make nothing short of a deal with God, a practice that the pagans did. And does it appear that Jephthah believes in human sacrifice? Well, he ends up practicing it. You remember, Moloch was the god of the Ammonites. And God said he hated them because they offered their children as sacrifices. There's even archaeology about Moloch having arms and you lay the child in the arms of Moloch in the fire and they fall in the fire and burn. Okay. You know, we say, oh, that's horrendous. No, it's not any more horrendous than killing babies by abortion. You know, they offer their sacrifices to Moloch for their God to do something for them. They offer their kids for abortion so they'd be free of the responsibility of that kid. The God of pleasure. Same gods, just different names. And you don't think someday God might just judge us for the horrendous sins that we commit? Very possible. The next thing I want to notice is God is righteous to judge his people for failure to follow his law. And what I mean by that is in God's redemption plan, he judges people for not following his law. In other words, there's... There's direct judgment and there's indirect judgment. Okay? Sometimes God directly judges you. Sometimes he allows you to receive the consequences of what you've done. That's judgment. Well, well when Jephthah comes back, God gave him victory. But God was going to do that anyway. But Jephthah, in his vow, guess who comes out his door? His one and only daughter. She comes dancing out the door and Jephthah smote his breast and said, You saddened me. And he says, I made a vow to the Lord, and I can't take it back. And his daughter says, do to me according to what's come out of your mouth. Just let me go bewail my virginity for two months. And, you know, it was, it was looked down upon for a, a daughter not to have a baby, not to have a child. Okay. 
and the fact that she never had a child produced offspring uh, was something to be grieved with, a sad point. So she goes for two months, and she comes back, and Jephtha offers her as a burnt offering. He kills his daughter. He does it because he had a manipulative vow. He had a secretized religion. He had Bible ignorance. It had a harmful outcome. This callous gesture shows his willingness to brutalize even his closest kin. And you say, what was the judgment? Jephtha had personal scars. Matter of fact, today when we think of Jephtha, you know, Hebrews calls Jephtha one of the heroes of faith. Did you know that? Which he was. Isn't that amazing? That's, that's, that's ironic. He's a hero of faith. He believed God. But he also was a disaster in that he's remembered for offering his daughter as a burnt offering to God. And God hates human sacrifice. You say, well, preacher, what if... And remember, there's public shame related with this. You say, what if uh, you make a vow? God says you have to pay your vows. However, if he knew his Bible, Deuteronomy 12, 31 says, you must not worship the Lord your God in their ways because in worshiping their gods, they do all kinds of detestable things. They even burn their sons and daughters in the fire as sacrifice to their gods. See, he was worshiping God in the way you worship Moloch. And God does not accept that kind of worship. Matter of fact, it says if you vow God, you better pay it. And the Bible does say that. But also... In Leviticus 27, 1 through 8, it talks about if anyone makes a special vow to the Lord involving the valuation of persons, if the person is female, the valuation should be 30 shekels. In other words, he could have went to a priest and redeemed his daughter for 30 shekels. Let me see how this puts. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give my wedding ring to build a new building. Okay, so we're going to take that and we're going to build a new building, right? Unless someone else comes and says, I'm going to redeem that wedding ring for $5,000. So they put $5,000 in the coffer to build a new building, and they take the wedding ring and give it back to the person who, who sacrificed it. You understand how the redemption works? Well, God provided that if it involves a person, you can redeem that person. So though he made an unwise vow, it revolved to something that was against God. All he had to do was humble himself and redeem her. But for some reason, he was... Didn't know he could do that? Maybe he was too proud to do that? I'm not sure. But he killed his daughters. He murdered his daughters. And we find the ignorance there. And God judges his people who disobey his law. And he lived with that, I'm sure, for the rest of his life. The question is today is, are you offering your children as a burnt offering? Let me tell you something, if you don't lead them to Jesus and witness to them, they're going to be a burnt offering for the wrath of God for eternity. Did you know that? Think about that. Do you hear what I just said? If you don't, if you spend all your time with your kids and the pleasures of the world not telling them about Jesus, they die, they will burn for eternity as a burnt offering. It's going to glorify the wrath of God. So while we judge Jephtha, we need to look back at ourselves, too. What do you all think? But God is righteous to judge his people. And this is all about, about uh, God's redemptive plan. And, and then after that, uh, God judged him. Ephraim came and said, uh, you didn't tell us when you went to fight the Ammonites, and we will burn your house. So now, now there's a civil war going on in Israel. Everything's coming undone here. Matter of fact, we see hate over love here when... Uh, when uh, the Gilead had conquered the, the fords uh, of Jordan and the Ephraimites tried to get back over in verse 6 of chapter 12, uh, the passwords say Shibboleth, and, and the, the Ephraimites could not say it. They said Sibboleth. You know, it's kind of like telling somebody, say Walmart, and they say Walmart, and you say, you're not one of us, so they killed them. And so they killed 42,000 of the children of Israel. Jephthah did. So he had a soap opera dysfunctional family. He's listed as a hero of faith. That's true. Because he accomplished what God wanted to do in the big picture. But personally, his life was a disaster. But God in his sovereignty is still going to accomplish his purpose. You follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Jephthah still fulfilled the purpose God had for Jephthah 
in defeating the enemy to preserve the children of Israel. And he's righteous to judge people who disobey his law, no matter who they are. We do reap what we sow. One more thing and we'll be through. God is faithful to provide what is needed to fulfill his covenant promises. And in the verse 8 through uh, verse 15 of Judges 12, we have three more judges. Didn't say much. They just born. They died. Uh, one rode uh, 70 donkeys, had 70 donkeys. And we're getting back to the fact that God is still providing uh, the leadership that's needed uh, to preserve the people to fulfill his covenant promises. In other words, God's still going to do what he's going to do. After World War II, in spite of all the tragedy and all that, through World War II, God used that to establish the nation of Israel again. The first time that it happened since the Old Testament. First time Israel was in their own homeland. Even during Jesus' time, they were occupied by Rome. So this is Old Testament fulfillment. When, when World War II took place, God provided all that was needed and, and to line things up the way he wanted. So now Israel is its own sovereign nation again. That is prophetic, folks. So God's hand is in the battle for the redemption of men. And in these chapters this morning, we have seen how God uses all kinds of people, all kinds of situations, even people who who have faith but are ignorant, God still uses them. You won't stop his bigger purpose. But those like Jephthah still suffered for the decisions he made. Oh, if we would all just be wise and take heed to God's word, maybe know God's word, it will keep us from a multitude of wrong decisions. What do you all think? It will it, it keep us on the right. It's a light into our path. We hide his words in our heart that we might not sin against God. You know, God wants you to be part of his kingdom. If you desire to be saved, he, he's ready to save you by faith in Jesus Christ. You know, Jephthah's known as a hero of faith. So, I guess that would mean Jephthah's in heaven. What do y'all think? Huh? So, no matter what you've done and where you've been, yeah, it's been ugly, like Jephthah. You, you might even have had an abortion and you're suffering guilt from that. I know of Christians who've had abortions, a bunch of them, you know. I, you know, they always suffer. They suffer that. But, you know, God forgives. Amen. And if you had your eyes wide open, you knew God's word, you wouldn't not start with. But we learn. And we had a lady one time in our church that had an abortion. And, and she said, what do I do about it? I said, well, why don't you start by uh, talking to our youth and sharing your testimony? And she did. She gave a testimony of one who had committed an abortion. And God's used her and using her in ministry today, not for that, but for other reasons. But her testimony is, yeah, God uses people who've had abortions. God uses people who've, who've been divorced. God's uh, used people who've been former homosexuals. God uses all kinds. God even uses those who've been proud all their life. Right? So let's learn from these passages. Let's learn that, you know, we don't mock God. God is just, but God is loving. And uh, as the world turns, let's pray. Father, uh, I pray that this morning is the decision time that we would respond in a way that honors you. And Lord, just uh, those who don't know Jesus, may they realize that they can be forgiven by coming to Christ, trusting in him, taking up their cross and following Jesus. Saved by faith. By grace through faith, and that not of yourself, of ourselves, it's a gift of God. Help us to respond in a way that honors you in Jesus' name.